Because we do not know some things about prayer, we have not got the results. As a result of this, we have no desire to pray. It becomes a drudgery. It becomes a ritual. Instead of a pleasure, to go and talk to him and know he's going to answer you. And there's nothing more exciting than to get an answer through to God. I mean, and know that he's the one that did it, and there was no other way it could have been done, and you was the one that prayed that prayer of faith. I want you to know that will stir you up and excite you. And if you never have that excitement, you ought to try. Amen. All right. We have the two types of prayers, current and immoral. You must learn it if you are successful in prayer. Let me use this example. When you go to pay your bills, you have some current bills and you have some that are not current. The, if you are buying a home or even an automobile, you know that you've got on that automobile possibly 36 months to pay. Well, you go and take the, that $72 payment down there or you send it off in the mail. It does not discourage you because they don't send you a note back that says paid in full. Because you know you've got some more payments coming up. But now, a light bill, that is a monthly bill, if you pay it and they don't mark it paid in full, now that's another subject. It's a current bill. It's supposed to be paid in full monthly. There's some bills that you just know you're going to put some more down. You've got it to do. You agreed to that. You signed up for that. And if you could learn this in your prayer life, you could start seeing far greater results. What happens is this. When you are praying a memorial type prayer, and if you do not realize that it's a memorial type prayer, you will give up sometimes just before the last thing. And you become discouraged. You, you'll uh, cease to pray. Because this may have been over a period of several years that you've been asking for one thing. And it didn't happen. And this is what you've got to drive home to the church you're preaching to. Or uh, you've got some dear old sister out there that's praying and praying and praying for years for that unsaved husband. And finally, she just, you tell her that, uh, well, let's believe for this revival. And she gave up three revivals ago. Well, if you can make her understand that she was praying a memorial type prayer, you will give her new hope for an answer. You will make her understand that she should not expect her paid in full stamp overnight. And it will give her new courage to go make another payment. Now, the example of a memorial prayer, we find that prayed by Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile praying an impossible prayer. And the Bible said that he just simply prayed and fasted and gave alms and kept sending up to God his supplication. I don't know how long, but evidently it was over a period of time this happened. Until finally God says to the angels, first of all, this little group of angels over here, I want you to knit a sheet and get some poor feathered beast and put on it and take it down to that apostolic preacher that's asleep on their house top. And then I want this messenger angel to drop down at the house of Cornelius because the man made some payments and there's so many of them that I'm going to have to do something about it. And so the last day came, he got up and prayed that morning I wonder how many times Cornelius got to the point that he wondered if God would ever hear him. You must understand that he was a Gentile, praying out of season. But this morning he allows us to pay his payment, and all of a sudden an angel steps down and says, Cornelius, thy prayers and thine arms have come up before God as a memorial. God's got to do something, boy. 
after all, you've just paid and paid and paid and paid, and the books is loaded with payments, and he had to turn another page and put continued on another one, and now then God says, I've got to do something. The man can't just keep sending it up here and me not do anything. So he reached out and started the operation of, to complete and answer that prayer. But no doubt it was prayed over a period, could have been years. Could have been his lifetime. He could have started as a child praying this prayer. I don't know. But all I know is it didn't happen overnight to Cornelius. And what came on before God was as a memorial. Now, if you can teach the sense that there's two types of prayer, first get it in your own crawl, if you'll pardon that expression, and learn it yourself. That's the best way to teach anything is to learn it yourself. <laughs> the old saying is, is among the educators, if you don't know how to do it, teach it. But uh, with this, it won't work. You've got to know how to do this to transfer it. You can get up and harp about prayer, but if you have been casual about it yourself, there's a ring to that. Your entire ministry reflects your prayer life. Your walk with God, your testimony, even your countenance witnesses either for or against you if you pray like you ought to. People can tell it. And don't think you will learn the tactics of a minister and uh, promotions. Now, I do know some of some men who have told me that they do not know how to pray that have great churches. And uh, I am pretty well convinced that they really know what they're saying. They didn't know how to pray. One pastor told me that, said I never did learn how to pray. And he had a great church. But you see, you had to pray in life, and you had to pray in church. What did he learn? He learned to inspire them to do it. Now, if you want to take that dangerous route, you can, but I refuse, because if I learn to promote saints to do something that I'm not doing myself, I am exposing myself to sin, to fall. If I give out, come on folks, let's worship, let's pray, fast, and I never do it myself. I'm asking them to do something I will not do myself, and I'm exposing myself to some dangerous pitfalls. I don't care who it is. Doesn't make any difference. The man that can get by without prayer is walking along a dangerous road at every moment of his life. So don't even try to learn that. The danger part of that is this particular preacher, he produced some preachers, and they didn't know how to pray. And you're going to have one crop up that's not going to have the ability that he had, and he don't know how to pray either, so you can imagine what the results will be. The main thing, for your own soul salvation, you're going to have to pray. There's no such, and a preacher of all people needs to pray, and we're going into that study later. But uh, I know you know this already, but dear Lord, help me to somehow drive it home, because after you get out there and get a little taste of success, the temptation will be there to stop your praying and start working on the momentum of past experiences. And there's nothing more dangerous because somewhere down the road, your checking account's going to run out. You've got to continually deposit into your account if you're going to call on it. All right, the memorial by prayer needs to be taught first to yourself, then to others, and you will have big faith and a soul will be saved because you made them understand that they not, don't always get their answers overnight. Now, there's some prayers that demand immediate results. Even if you're praying for someone that's sick or for yourself, you'll find it written in God's Bible that two types of prayer is mentioned again. If any is sick among you, let him call the elders of the church, and Lord with all, the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. 
That's current instant results. But did you ever notice the next one said, let him that is afflicted pray. Now it's possible that that affliction will always move overnight. We hope it does. But sometimes those afflictions have got to be prayed over a simply because it may be a test of our faith, or it may be that we need to be washed out. It, uh, there may be a lesson to be learned. So even in praying for the sick, you've got to realize there's two types of prayer. And if you can convince that dear old soul, whoever she or he may be, that that affliction in that body, just because we didn't get an answer tonight, doesn't mean we're not going to get our hearing. Things have been destroyed because they did not understand the two types of prayer, even for the sick. I didn't get my results tonight. And then faith died. But if you can make them understand, let him that is afflicted pray. You may have to talk to him again tomorrow about it. Then you have built up hope and faith that one of these days I'm going to get my answer. Now, a little illustration that I use, and may work for you, it may not, but uh, it at least proves my point. The fact that there is such a thing as a layaway plan, and I'm sure that you boys have heard of it, at least. I've used it myself. I've actually had suits on layaway so long that I forgot the color they were. And it's an exciting thing when you take that last $3 down there and you hand them $3 and they hand you a suit. And that's the cheapest suit I've bought in a long time. $3 and got a suit. But you see, there's records that are showing I had a lot of those three dollars. And the majority of the time, this is how prayer, prayer is answered. Sometimes at the least expected moment, your payments catch up. And God says, I'm ready to answer. And it seems to ease in, seems to simple. But you must remember that David said one time, he said, Oh Lord, Thou tellest of my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? God's got him a big old bottle, and every tear you shed is going in that bottle. And he's got a book, and he's writing down the prayers you pray. And he's telling of our wanderings. He knows all about all that's going on. He's heard us so many times we saw him over that one particular need. And after a while that bottle gets full, he's got to do something about it. And if you can make them understand, that old unsaved boy, that unsaved husband, that unsaved neighbor that you pray for so very long, if you just keep paying those three dollar payments, one more tear may do it. One more day of fasting may get him out of the way. And I've seen that in revivals. I have enjoyed weeping the results of sometimes years. I remember one particular occasion when in revival this old boy had been around Pentecost and faithfully came to church for 30 years. Fearful services, dreadful services, Calvary type services, love, mercy, name it. He had heard it and laughed at all of it. But that wife of his just kept paying her three dollars. Believing that someday he's going to market paid in full. And I'll never forget that night, that hard man that everybody had tried, and that didn't really mean that I was you know, something special. There'd been greater preachers than myself reached for him and then sat back there and smile at him. If there's anything that's hard for a preacher, is to preach maybe the judgments of God and see somebody grinning at him. As though, buddy, you're not affecting me. So you might as well get on with your story. <laughs> and uh, he sat back there through some minutes and he learned to just shake them all around. But this particular night, that dear woman's prayers was stacked up before God until he said, I've got to do it. <laughs> and you know what I did to get into the altar? It was the simplest thing. I just simply walked back and I said, come go with me. And he got up and followed me like a little baby 
and pray through in just a few minutes. Thirty years of revival after revival. Was it any great thing I did? No. The lady just understood to keep stacking the payments. And I happened to be there when she got him out of layaway and got to enjoy. Praise the Lord. And that's fun. And if you want that kind of fun, you teach them that there is such a thing. And they'll believe God and they'll stack up some more sacrifice during your revival. And somewhere in there they'll get some results. Or during the time you're pastoring that church, you'll get it. If you make them understand the two types of prayer. Expect some things now. But if you don't do it, let it fall where it will. Let it fall into the memorial type praying. But don't give up on it. That's why the book says you have need of patience. But after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Now that scripture alone tells me that I may not get my answer right now. I have need of patience to keep stacking up some papers. So you have now question have two types of prayer. Now then, we want to enter into the steps to successful praying. And then back to Daniel's five point prayer. Let's call this one over here the channels of approach. And let's call this steps to successful prayer. First Timothy 2 and 1 gives us the channels of approach, not necessarily in order. So how you copy them down doesn't mean one thing. But I could not tell you in two weeks anything more valuable than to learn what I want you to learn about the channels of approach. You have supplication. I'm on breathe. You have prayer. You have intercession. And thanksgiving. Now what do we mean by channels of approach? In the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, we have examples of spiritual things. Spiritual parallels are found throughout the Old Testament. One of the spiritual parallels that you must recognize is found in the approach to a king. You do realize that an individual, even the queen, could not just walk in and make her request. Is that what you found in your Bible? They have to be invited or else if the king and the king would reach out the golden scepter and touch them, that meant you can go ahead and approach and give your request. Now that's in God's Bible and it's there for a reason and it's there for a, an example unto us. Make a little note of that to where you can remember that. Study on it sometime. You might want to read on some occasions where that actually happened. And you'll learn that approaching the king is not done in just any old manner that you want. We are dealing with the king of kings and the lord of lords. And when I say that he will not accept any manner, I do not mean by that that he wants great big long phrases and well-worded sentences and big words. That's not what I'm talking about. Attitude is the main thing that God is looking at in our lives. But we must learn that our approach to God 
cannot be casual. It cannot be at our own will. We've got to come on his terms or we're wasting our hour in prayer. And believe me, there's been many, many hours wasted in what was thought to be prayer time because it was not the right approach. I contend by study of his word, by practical experience, personal experience, I contend that there is a channel of approach every time you go and pray that God will accept one of these channels of approach. And I contend that if you try any of the others when he's calling for one, I contend you're wasting your time. And since we spend such little time in prayer, we really need to make it count while we're there. And uh, that's what I'm interested in. I want, if I could do one thing, I mean it's boiling inside of me, if I could somehow stir you and awaken you and teach you to be nothing but a great prayer warrior. You would forget great oratory ability. You would forget sermonizing. You would forget a lot of things. And I'm not discrediting good preaching. I believe that that's an important point. I believe you ought to have something to feed the people every once in a while. But you'd forget a lot of that if you knew this. Because when a man knows how to touch God, he can get results if he can't hardly have a talk. Now that may sound a little bit, but I know what I'm talking about. I've seen them that way. They've got results, and when you started to compare their speaking ability to someone else's. Have you ever, don't think critical tonight, but have you ever heard a preacher that preached a great sermon but did not get anyone in the altar or did not get anybody prayed to? There's a reason for all of that. I mean, the sermon was great. You, you wouldn't have been embarrassed to hear it at one of the greatest gatherings. But the results was not there. Now, there's a reason for that, and you need to find out what it is, and one of it is simply what I'm telling you tonight, that God has a channel of approach that he'll accept. You go to prayer tonight before you go to bed, remember this one thing. I want to find out which one of these channels he's taking me tonight. These boys got these uh, CBs. They, they know more about channels and the value of them, I guess, and most of us. If you're going to talk to a man on channel 9 and don't turn to 13, you won't get it. Well, I'm trying to tell you God's on 13 some nights and we're on 9. And you wonder why no results. And you fret and you become discouraged. And after, all, after a while, your prayer life is, is dying because it's not interesting anymore. The results is not coming. Friend, when you go to get some, I mean some genuine results, you'll be at the prayer meeting next morning. There's nothing more exciting than getting a prayer through to God. I can not think of anything. To know that I've gone around and said, God, now I want this, and would you do this? And a few days passes, and you look up, and there it is. And man, you know you prayed that prayer. And it's very possible nobody else prayed it but you. And whether they did or not, I generally always claim my part of it. I don't believe I'm wrong in doing that. I need to encourage myself in the Lord. And that's the only way to do it. I don't glory in it. I did not do it because I was anything great, but I, I do have to give myself a little credit because it builds my faith. And I believe that's a secret to successful praying. If a man's always going to condemn himself and destroy himself and never ever accept any credit for his prayer, it doesn't mean he gets up and says, Folks, man, I have the one done all that praying. I don't mean that type thing. I preached for a fellow one time and I made mention that I was going to pray for the saints, that they would get stirred and couldn't sleep at night. And one of the best members of his church got us around the table and 
made the statement, said, Brother Bean, you know, you mentioned the other night that you was going to pray we couldn't sleep, said I haven't slept since. The pastor became very jealous. He says, uh, I was the one who said that. Now, that's not what I'm talking about there. That's a little bit. But I do believe I need to give myself credit. Do you understand what I'm saying? That my faith might be built up. Thank the Lord. Supplication, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving, the channels of approach. Let's take prayer to begin with. You know, it's strange why our entire subject is prayer, and yet prayer is one of the channels of approach. But I think maybe you'll understand it as we get into it a little more. Let's take prayer to begin with. Now, I must make this statement very clear, and not only for the subject of prayer, for any subject. When you start to emphasize one part, anywhere in the Bible, you, you are suddenly in a dangerous position of making yourself look like you're contradicting another part. And uh, you... I'm sure you possibly have noticed that already in hearing preachers and maybe preached yourself. But when you start to drive one point home or turn a spotlight on a certain subject, if you're not careful, it makes it sound like you are contradicting another subject when all you're doing is bringing out this one. So this is what I want you to understand as we go into this subject of prayer. Prayer is simply talking to God. That's all in the world is. Whilst I was speaking in prayer, I was just talking to him. Now this type of praying does not necessarily mean that you feel all that much. It does not mean that you would be talking in tongues or weeping. You do not feel any particular spirit. You may be just simply talking to God. But now please, don't hang up there and justify not praying through and say, boy, I'm praying now. I start out with prayer and try to get the rest of it. I seek for supplication. I open my channels up for intercession. I want thanksgiving if it'll come to me. If none of this comes, I search my heart. If everything's clear, and I know it's right with God, and there's no hindrance for me to go further in prayer, deeper in prayer, then I'll just accept prayer tonight. I'm just talking to God. And in our points that we'll bring up later on the steps to successful praying, we're going to have to refer back to this. But let's start with this to begin with. Prayer is just what it means. It's just talking to God. And uh, some folks think that I'm not getting my prayer through unless I'm feeling a mighty vibration. Now, I want to feel it, and I seek to feel it. And I believe you ought to pray through all of it. I don't believe you ought to go a long time without talking in tongues. That old doctrine of one time talking in tongues, you can live for God from then on. Man, that's wrong. Somebody is, is, is doing you an injustice. You've got to have your soul renewed. Are you going to dry up spiritually and you're going to lose your faith and you lose your inspiration? Everything about you will die. So you need to be refilled. So don't take this prayer as a justification that, that the Brother Bean says, well, I'm not supposed to feel anything, so month in and month out I just dry. They say goodnight, Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about. If you have searched out these channels and they don't show up a red light or some kind of a signal, well, then just go to talking to them. As friend to friend. And don't let doubt come in your mind simply because you're not vibrating with weeping or with the rejoicing or talking in tongues that your prayer is not going through. Don't I believe when I get down there and I search my heart and it's nothing there that's wrong, and I don't feel anything else but just talking to him, I've got just as much confidence that he's hearing that as if I was screaming to the top of my voice with weepings. Because it's one of the channels of approach. 
Now generally this takes more faith than the others. This kind of praying takes a little more faith to operate because you don't particularly have all that much feeling. It's, uh, you're just talking to him. But some of the greatest uh, answers I've ever received from God was just pray. I remember, uh, pardon personal references, but so I'm like uh, the apostle Peter was, I believe. He said we cannot have to speak those things which we have seen and heard. So, uh, but I remember praying for a man that was deaf and uh, came up on a prayer. No, I didn't feel a thing. Man, it didn't never come. I just left. through obligation to God as of the man and honoring his faith, I laid hands on him. And it was the driest prayer of my existence, I guess. But that old man came to church the next morning hearing. It was not a matter that I had to wait. Oh, oh brother, uh, uh, no, I forgot his name now, but anyhow, he used to pray for the sick quite a bit. And he was praying for a lady one night, and he just said, Oh, God, heal this woman in Jesus' name. And she looked up and said, But, but uh, brother, die, I'm real sick. So he grabbed her and shook her a little bit. So my God, he said, Oh, Lord, heal her in Jesus' name. She was satisfied. She could not imagine without some type of a massive shaking that he even was sincere. Now this is the error that you will find people's minds about faith. I believe that, uh, I don't think I should just drive around for you. I believe I need to get out on my knees sometime. I believe I need to get along with God. But I believe I can walk and talk with him just like I can walk and talk with other days. Friend to friend. Well, the day is, this is the way it is now, and, and so on, and here we go, and we're talking. We're friends. And I'll show you by the Bible that there is an attitude that God enjoys in you when you can stand up like a man and approach God as a friend. All right, prayer is simply talking to God without any particular feelings. Be sure you check your heart to see that it's not <laughs> something wrong with you is the reason you're not feeling anything. The next step into prayer is supplication. Supplication is a little more intense than just pray. Generally, supplication has got feelings with it. It's got tears. Or it's got some emotional feeling involved when you get that deep into prayer. And supplication helps, helps our faith. When the spirit of supplication will come on you, it's a little more intense, and it helps you to know that God's helping you pray. And that's why some folks get confused, is when they don't get that feeling, they think God's not hearing them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he doesn't hear because you don't have the spirit of supplication. Intercession is the deepest prayer that you can pray. When you have received the spirit of intercession, you are as far into that inner court of talking to God that you'll ever get. You have arrived at the holy place. There is no such a thing as a deeper, more intense communion between your soul and your God than intercession. And generally, intercession is with great groanings it is with as Paul said groanings that cannot be uttered it is the despair of the soul it's a time when it seems like you must have the answer or die intercession is that type of praying that takes physical strength a lot of people don't uh, they don't even know what intercessory prayer is I usually look for the intercessors. If I go preach a revival, I usually look to see if God's got one in that church. And thoroughly encourage them. Because I have seen them save a service. One particular place I was at, there was a little old fellow woman that was the intercessor for that revival. I have seen the service tie up and things were not moving. 
And I'd glance over at her, and there she'd be getting drawn in knots. I mean, just physically. I've seen her literally fall over on the seat were groanings that could not be uttered. But it wouldn't be but a few minutes till things started breaking and happening. Because she went into that inter sanctuary with God. And generally, intercession is a particular prayer. Would you please note this? It is a particular prayer for a particular thing. And generally for a particular time. Very seldom would you ever go into intercession that there would not be at least quick results. Maybe not immediate, but quick results. Intercession generally produces the current answers because they are particular prayers for particular needs for particular times. It's something that uh, if you are going to a allow your soul to become led and directed in prayer you uh, you cannot be your own because at three o'clock in the morning the spirit may hit you well you can't say well I'm sleepy and I'll pray at nine because intercession means I gotta have it now the high God of heaven knows the answer is needed out there badly yeah. and you would think that God would go ahead and do it but he won't he's chosen that men pray and as I've often said God doesn't care till we care and that's a good saying you need to remember if that's not true why do whole cities lie waste and nobody there saved why don't he just go save them but God has chosen that through the prayer and intercession of men that souls would be saved and things would happen. Certainly, the Bible said he knows what we need before we ask. But he won't do anything about it till we ask. He has chosen the method of prayer. So when he knows what's needed, and he reaches out and says, Okay, I need you. Let's say it's Brother Jimmy Lee tonight. At three o'clock in the morning, he's walked with God, and he's open for calls 24 hours. And a, a real prayer warrior is open for calls. He can't say, I'll pray at 10 o'clock in the morning. He's got to say, I'm ready, Lord, anytime. And that's the very reason why a lot of people shun him. Let's say there's a need over here, desperate need. God sees it. And he searches his camp out. And he looks and says, there's a heart I can touch. And he'll do it. I, I can trust him. Remember this. You'll never be used in intercession if you haven't been consistent in living for God. If your life is not consistent and faithful, you'll never know this spirit of intercession. Because he's got to know you before he'll trust you to go that far. As an example, God gave me an example of this. And uh, I'll refer to it now and give you some other examples later of intercession. I was in South America. The morning about 4 o'clock, we were awakened. A friend of mine was with me there, and we were suddenly awakened with a terrible burden of prayer. Now, when I say that intercession is a particular prayer for a particular thing, that does not mean that we always know what that is. But the Bible teaches us that the Spirit bears our infirmities and prays for us. In other words, sometimes the Bible says we do not know what to pray for. So the Spirit takes over. But don't forget there is a particular thing that the Spirit's dealing with. Well, this morning we felt such a heaviness to pray. And for about uh, two and a half hours, I mean hard praying prevail groanings not knowing what it was but you can be rest assured it was some particular need we got on a plane and was going from Barranquilla, Colombia to Bogota and on the way we stopped at an airport at uh, 
I believe it was Calca. I forget the name of the place. But anyhow, it was right at the edge of the Caribbean. The runways ran right up to the water edge. And we were coming in, and at that time of the year, it was heavy, dense fog. And uh, the pilot could not see his way at all. And he was depending entirely on the tower giving him information. And they gave him evidently the wrong information or else he didn't follow it as he should. And we looked out and the wheels of that plane was just a matter of two or three feet from the Caribbean. He had undershot the runway, oh, I don't know, I'd say a good half mile. And uh, it seemed to me, I don't believe I'm imagining, but it seemed to me that that plane instead of gradually rising, it seemed like a strong hand picked it up about, oh, at least a, say, at least a hundred feet or so. Just seemed like instantly I felt a strength. And we landed that plane and, of course, waited around for the fog to clear away some. Got back on it and started on to Bogota and we were sitting back there, passengers. And here comes the pilot. Walked down the aisle and this is very uncomfortable commercial airline. He went back and passed everyone till he got to us. And he stood there and says, uh, gentlemen, in his broken English, he says, would you like to come in the cockpit and watch us fly the plane? Well, planes have always fascinated me. That's, I could just almost live in one. Well, man, yes. Didn't know it was possible. So my partner was with me there, he wasn't interested, he just peeped in when I sat down. But I went in and sat on that third seat there between the pilot, the co-pilot. I saw the mountain peaks before any of the other passengers did. I saw the deep gorges and the canyons. I saw the landing strip. The other passengers were simply looking out a little window, seeing things as they passed them. I saw them a long time before we got to them. Got to uh, Bogota, I said, you gentlemen like for me to go back while you land? He said, well, stay here, it's all right. Watch us land. I heard him talk uh, to the towers as they pass over different cities. It's a thrill to me. That was lesson number two God was giving me on intercession. I didn't realize at the time, but it's been very valuable to me since then. And then, to just put the icing on the cake for me, he gave me the scripture where David said, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. And then he said, Blessed is the man whom God chooses and causes to approach unto him. Blessed is that man. That God says, uh, you like to come in the company. You want to watch me fly this thing? You see, there is such a thing as walking with God till you can see mountain peaks ahead of you. Some people never know what's going to happen till it's done happening. They're just peeping out, riding as a passenger. I refuse to be that type of a preacher. I refuse to be so lackadaisical and unconcerned that I simply peep out a little peephole and see where others have been. Every now and then, God, would you trust me to call me to the cockpit and let me know what's going to happen, the storm that's ahead, and prepare me for it and tell me about it? I'm not a busybody. I just like to get in the cockpit with him. I like the communion. I like to hear the, call it, the uh, conversations that are going on. And it's a thrill to me to watch him maneuver the thing. Praise God, there's no thrill on earth. Now here I have interceded actually. And I believe with all of my heart, I'll die believing that that two hours or two hours and a half that we spent in intercession is what saved us from ditching the thing in the Caribbean. I'm convinced that was it. I believe the hand of God picked the plane up myself. Fantastic or whatever you want to say, I believe that. I, I know God said, in fact, there was a salesman uh, on that plane for that particular airline, and that man was very concerned. He said, do you realize we were only about two feet from that water? He said, that's a miracle. 
That's, that's something. I believe with all my heart the intercession of two hours saved the whole room and all the passengers. Then, on top of that, the little practical lesson of allowing a pilot to pass others his passengers in there and come to mind where I was sitting and say, would you like to come in the company? Now, I consider that an honor. You know, you know I mean, I back and rode as a passenger. And many times we're satisfied to just sit down with our little prayer. And I repeat our little good night, Jesus, when he's begging us, come on in. I'll show you the intricate parts of this thing. I'll show you the mountain peaks out there. I'll tell you about things out there that, that others cannot know. I'll carry you on the wings of the morning and let you see what's fixing to take place that day. And friends, to me, that's valuable for a preacher. If you're going to pastor a church, you better know ahead of time what's fixing to happen. Right. You better have a fellow in that that's what I mean. I mean, managing that rig to come to you and look in on what's going on. You want to live in such an atmosphere of prayer and consecration that blessed is the man whom God chooses. Not a pilot of a little old South American airline, but the high God of heaven said, Here's a seat for you for a while. And I'll tell you some secrets. My Bible says, he tells me very clearly, he reveals his secrets to the servants, the prophets. If you want to really know some walk in the spirit of prayer that once in a while, he can get you in on that particular prayer. I'll give you an example. Sister Freeman, a missionary to South Africa, said on her first voyage over, they had a number of children. I forget now, five or six and a little bitty baby and every one of the children developed whooping cough and the baby developed pneumonia and she had had some nursing experience and she said I knew that my baby was dying and of course when you're out on a ship and you die or your loved one dies they bury you at sea and she had the horror of thinking about watching them put her child overboard into that ocean wrestled with them for days and nights because they were all sick. She said she was so exhausted that she could not even pray anymore. All she knew to do was she knelt by the baby's bed and said, whispered to God, Oh God, lay me on somebody's heart. Let somebody somewhere pray for me. And said she was kneeling there and all of a sudden it felt like a warm breeze began to blow into that ship cabin. And she saw that baby's chest relax into normal breathing and into a normal sleep. And it was well. She received two letters from widely separated areas. Both of them said the same thing. Neither one of them knew the other. Sister Freeman, what was wrong with you on a certain date and the baby and a certain hour of the day? We were compelled to pray. Blessed is the man whom God chooses. God reached way up here in the United States somewhere. I don't know where they were. So it's to this one over here saying, I've got a child out there that's just in despair has whispered to me to lay her on somebody's heart. Would you take her? Yes, Lord. I'll go in the country. I'll care the Lord. And in the meantime, he reaches for another one. And both of them, exactly the date, exactly the same time, said the same thing. What was wrong with you and the baby? And she checked it out and compared it, and it was identical the same time that she had knelt there and waited and said, lay me on somebody's heart. To me, preach your sermons. And have everybody walk up to you and say, Oh, that was a great message. But if I could just know God would trust me tonight to let me go to that country and talk to him about a, a specific meaning, friend, that's the height of honor. What do you 
then blessed me. Blessed is the man whom God chooses. Says, come here. I trust you. I, I can trust you with a burden. You won't shrink. You won't say I'm too tired. You won't excuse yourself that you're too busy. I trust you. You come in the cockpit. The need is great. Praise God. Oh, heaven help us. Hallelujah. I wish that they would quit us and remember this. The book said, without question, when Zion prevailed, she brought forth her children. When you ever reach that intercessory spirit for soul, you can just about guarantee you fix to get that. Oh, I'll never have brought to intercession that I didn't get results. Never had in my life. You certainly can, but we were in the Bible service in Louisville several years ago. We first went there. There was one teenage boy coming to the altar. At the end of two weeks of revival services, there were twenty or more in the altar every night. But we hadn't had a breakthrough at all as far as anyone receiving the Holy Ghost. We had the service that night. God moved the altar filled up, but there was no one to receive the Holy Ghost. There were several that had already stopped praying. All of a sudden, a burden of intercession hit the pastor's wife. She began moaning, groaning, travailing, and almost rolling on the floor as though she was in agony. Travailing. There were some that had not even gone to the altar that night. One young lady in particular that hadn't even gone to the altar. But by the time that service was over, this young lady had run to the altar. She had been filled with the Holy Ghost. Two others were filled with the Holy Ghost that night that very likely would have stopped praying. The revival was continued for an additional week as a result of that break. And there were 13 filled with the Holy Ghost during uh, that night and the balance of that week. One year after that, I talked to the pastor. I said, how are those folks feeling to receive the Holy Ghost in a revival? He said, all 13 of them are still going on for God. But if it hadn't been for that sister getting under a burden in her section, that break would have never come. One of the use of tolls, and that's the attitude you should have that will always be available for God to talk to you about one of these channels of approach. Do you think you're being foolish and carnal and, and uh, carrying on your frivolity? you think that entices the spirit of prayer? Or would you think an attitude of prayer? I believe there's an attitude of prayer. I believe there's a spirit of it. You may not be praying all the time, but the spirit of it's with you. Amen. Brother Crowe made a statement here that every man's got a handle on him. Well, we we should have that the years that same statement in reference to those who God uses in prayer. If He uses you, you've got to have a handle available. You can't just uh, run wild all day and then all of a sudden, man, I feel a burden. It doesn't work that way. That's why the Bible said to a preacher to shun vain and profane battles, lest they leave no more ungodliness. That doesn't mean you can't laugh at all, but did you know you can get so frivolous, the spirit of prayer will leave you. It will not abide with the unconcerned, unconsecrated heart. It will stay there. It's got to have that heart sensitive and an attitude of prayer. And if you desire anything to obtain, let it be in this. Please. Let it be said of you that's a praying man. Not for the honor that's involved, as the Pharisees desired, but I'd rather it be said of you he was a praying man than a preacher, a great preacher. Because a praying man can produce or a preacher can. And that's not really God, that's not positive about them to be right. I believe you know that, but Peter said we like these things and you though you know things to preach.
put you in remembrance. Now, Thanksgiving, this is a, it's, a, it's almost a, like Channel 21 on the CB, it's hardly ever used. Because it is seemingly out of place when you go to pray. Now, if they were singing, I'll fly away, fine. Or uh, if they had it pepped up real good, fine. But Thanksgiving, in my personal prayer life, I'm going to tell you what, you're missing many answers unless you understand that there are times when God will not take supplication, He will not take prayer, He will not take intercession. The only thing you'll receive is thanksgiving. There are times when you kneel before Him that He will take nothing but thanksgiving. You're wasting your time. Well, I've gone to him and puckered up to twirl about something I really needed, and it wouldn't cry. All I could feel was, thank you, Jesus. The channel he wanted me in was praise. And you see, when I obey and fit in that, I don't mean to ask at that moment. One missionary said she was desperately praying for a specific need, and all of a sudden in a vision an empty basket dropped in front of her. And she said, Lord, what does that mean? He said, fill it with praises and I'll answer your request. Oh, we could get so much more from God if we understood that. And, and sometimes it's hard to do that because you need this, man. Look like it's going to fall in on you. And you kneel down there and you think, surely I ought to pucker up and cry. But I get my face all screwed up and it won't even work. Well, can you get a little supplication in the head? No, no, no. Hit dead in streets until all of a sudden you feel something begin to roll inside to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Evangelist told us on my wife's grandfather that she was he was preaching the revival for Dad Kilgore. He was in the church praying one day, and Dad Kilgore came in, knelt down, and for one hour, he did nothing but say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Thank you, Jesus. Didn't ask for a thing. Man, that's wasting time. I need to get in there and get some things asked so I know to get out of here and get all this done. I tell you the quickest way to get your answers is to come like he's taking you. If he's wanting thanksgiving, man, you better just straighten your face up and get you some words of praise. Uh, and he'll he'll answer your request. Fill the basket with praise. I mean I I just yeah, but you don't know how serious this is. It don't make a difference. Did you know what I believe happens sometimes? I believe that's where faith goes in here. It's when you can quit squalling or quit begging and quit asking and just go to thinking. Him. Faith went into here right then. You just shoved her in grandma. And things are fixing to happen. Praise God. Oh, I believe it. I believe God requires that sometimes of our faith is to not ask for anything but trust that he will do it. And again, remember now, when I get to some other points, I don't want you to think I'm contradicting myself. I'm fixing to get to some points to where I stress the fact we need to specify and ask certain things. But it does not a token. Who am I to judge? Who am I to say, I'm just, uh, I'm going to do it my way, Lord, and you're going to hear me. You can't threaten God. He, uh, you just got to take him just as he's... If he reaches the golden scepter out there, you, you accept it on his terms. And you'll get final results, and after all, surely that's what you're praying for. It's divine results. All right, let's go to the steps to successful praying. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 19. O Lord, hear. Step number one. O Lord, forgive. What's the next one? Hearken and do. And then 
can't defer enough. Now you will understand that I do not mean that these are the exact words you repeat. Not at all. I'm sure that you would understand that when you go to God. But this is the steps, however you word it. This is the first step to approach God. Oh God, hear me. Now does it seem strange to you that he says here and then he says hearken? You've got to realize there's such a thing as hearing without hearkening. I could tell one of you to uh, do a certain thing or come here. You heard me, but you didn't hearken to me. There's a difference. And it seems a little technical to mention this in prayer, but it's important. And if you could learn it, I'll guarantee you'll start. If these points tonight can sink in deep enough, I guarantee you'll start seeing some answers shortly of things that you really wanted from the Lord. Oh, the Lord, hear me. Now, that simply means, God, let me get your attention. Uh, you've got to have his attention before you can get an answer from him. Now, how do I get his attention? Now write this down because I may ask you this. I'm not sure I give a test or not, but, but I want you to get this if you don't get nothing else. Here. Now Lord, let me get your attention. How do I get God's attention? Did you know how I get his attention? It was for him to get your attention. When he's got your attention, You've got his attention. A divided mind, a scattered thought, a casual approach with your mind running about 40 miles an hour, you're not going to touch God nor get his attention. Your approach to God must be with a single heart, a single eye. It's got to be that way. God will not accept it. Your example in the Old Testament. Your example of this is found in the Old Testament where the priest went in to the holy place and veils were all around him. He could not see outside. He was enclosed. The scripture that backs this up, you may want to make a note of it, is when you pray, enter into your closet. Now that doesn't mean go in the closed closet. It means get everything else shut out. Now you have experienced this, I'm certain. Have you ever thought to pray and had so many things on your mind? Did you get through to God that way? You can't. God won't accept it. Oh Lord, here I want your attention, and the best way to get his attention is for him to have your undivided attention. Pull the curtains around you. Get in your closet. Shut the world out. And you're fixing to get a hold of God. That's when a lot of times you begin to feel a little spirit moving over you. And that makes it easy to pray. You've got his attention. But now, just because you felt God, and here's a tremendous mistake. Both preachers and saints, and if you ever preach it on prayer, stress this point. Sometimes people kneel to pray just to feel God. And the minute they feel it, up to the moment, uh, he's not there for at least. Somebody said, I needed to pray till I touched him, and I just touched him. Now I'm in a hurry. When really, you just then got to the place to pray. The only song says, pray until you pray, and then you can pray the clouds away. Pray until you touch God and then now then. Now, and that's no time to leave. God can be absorbed. Leave that thing plugged in. I've got an electric shaver that you just keep it plugged in. You can cut it off the shaver. But if it runs down, then the only other thing to do is to plug it in and, and turn it on wood cord and use it. But as soon as you unplug, there's no life there. 
And a lot of our power with God is just exactly the same way. We don't stay long enough to get charged. We just plug in quickly, cause a little spark, whoops, okay, now I'm ready to go. I was in a hurry to get I just wanted to be sure he's close around somewhere while I wasn't backsliding. So I felt a little touch now and then I'm in a hurry. But when you listen, you listen to the entire program of prayer when you don't learn to get to the place when you feel him and get his attention, now we start the other points. Step number two. And you pardon me if we have to go back over some of this. I may spend two or three nights on this one thing. If I can get this in there, I can get it to you. I'll guarantee you that there will be some results in your praying and prayer will become more exciting to you. Guarantee it. Step number two, after you've got God's attention by Him getting your attention, by closing the world out, entering into your closet, pull the curtains around you, and now it's you and God, and the world is outside. And suddenly you feel an attitude come over you, and an atmosphere surrounds you. Now, God, what am I to tell you? What's my next approach to you? What's my next step, rather, to really come into your presence and get some answers? If this step is overlooked, it, the whole framework is torn down. Oh Lord, forgive. Notice the pause, the semicolon. Represents a pause. This man waited after he said that. He was in no hurry. People that are in a hurry cannot get things from God. I'm just contending that, that you cannot. You gotta slow down if you get things from God. Don't push it around that fast. Oh Lord, forgive me. Can I touch God really scripturally if I've got sin in my life? You believe you can? Impossible. Notice what Daniel said. While I was confessing my sins and and uh, he made mention of what some of those sins might be. We've not kept your covenant. Uh, we have not obeyed your commandments. We've committed iniquity. We've done wickedly. We've departed from precepts. We haven't hearkened unto the servants, the prophets. Our uh, saint, get all crossed up with the preacher. They just well quit praying. God's kind of here. And yet you've got them by the almost worried about their hours of prayer and have all this crossed up in their lives. Wasting time. And you've got to realize that that saint may be most valuable if they could be made to understand my heart's got to be clean before you hear it. You cannot pray over unrepentant sins and expect God to hear you. That is not what it is. Oh Lord, forgive a repentant heart is the one that moves God the quickest. That person that's always justifying themselves never sees their wrong. Go to God and just talk it all over with him and as though he heard her, walked away, and yet that stuff's still down in there. All right, Brother Glasgow. How can you help someone that... Uh, as a repenting spirit, yet they feel like they never get forgiveness. All right, we're going to go into that, Brother Glasgow, just a little bit later. Uh, that's very, very vital point. Right. As I told you, I had my little uh, deal that I somebody brought me from South America. This little fellow, have you ever seen him that was balanced on his tiptoes? I had it and somebody broke it. I was going to bring it in here and every once in a while tip him. Because every bit of this has got to have balance to it. Right. Now, the person that comes to God and gets God's attention by singling their mind toward Him must, by next step, search their hearts. But some folks stop right there and never go any further. <laughs> and waste their hour doing nothing but saying, my God, I'm unworthy, and all of this. And friend, 
You can tell God you're unworthy for a solid hour and thoroughly convince yourself you're unworthy and brainwash yourself until sure enough you believe you can't have it and sure enough you didn't get it. Just as much as you can overlook this step and not get your prayers through, you can hang up on that step and not get your prayers through. It grieves my God for you to consistently repent of the same thing. Now, if you bring it over again, naturally, better repent. But you'd be surprised all the faithful saints who are living on step number two. And it's you and I's job to, you, we got to get them out of there. Got to do it. And there are scriptures you can help them with. And we will certainly want to go into those scriptures and dig them out. In fact, I'll tell you what I plan to do. I just plan to preach to you like you was, we was having revival. After I get some of these points over, I'm going to preach you some prayer sermons. If that will not be offensive to you. And give you some points on how to dig them out of step number two. Hallelujah. How to teach them intercession. I mean, there may be 40 sermons on intercession. If one don't work, the other will use another. But we need to learn them. They need to be there available to us for the Spirit to anoint us and use us. You cannot imagine really how valuable some of this is when you get about a half a church. I went to one place where from the pastor's life on down, every altar call, all of them came to the altar. There wasn't any room for the sinner. First place, there wasn't any conviction on the sinner because the saints absorbed it. I love to get up, mind you, one night and say, Look, no more. Seemed like they were relieved. Uh, really, they wanted to hear it, but they were scared not to come on back. But many of us, I had to do that. I didn't do it unkindly, but I said, look, explain why. Uh, you fill in this altar. Some of see you come here and say, what's the use of me going? Every night I see the same bunch down there, but, and it's the whole church, pastor's wife included. That spirit can lodge in a church and destroy it. On the other hand, the unrepentant spirit can lodge and destroy it. And everybody say amen and wave your right hand just a little. <laughs> These long hours, some of you boys getting real sleepy. Amen. <laughs> Let's stand up and praise the Lord. <laughs>
definite. Even in the home life, the Bible teaches that there are problems between husband and wife that if they get all crossed up and go to pray, God will hear them. The domestic problems around the home will actually hinder prayers from getting through to God. And saints need to know that. Sometimes these big old bully men think they come in and all but cuss their wife out and still go to the prayer room and just touch God. They can't do no such of a thing. Vice oh, yeah. versa, they can't do it. Right. You see, I've got to treat that wife of mine as a saint. She's my sister in the Lord besides being my wife. I can't mistreat her and get by God. Oh, yeah. I can't walk to this pulpit and know that I have spoken sharply to her without apologizing. And I don't believe that's being too sensitive either. When you get to the point that that's too much trouble, you're fixing to seal your conscience. Mm -hmm. Write this statement down right here in big, bold letters. Hold it going, Father. Self-justification is the first steps toward a reprobate mind. You go to justifying yourself on points, first thing you know, you can't do anything wrong. That is, to you, it's not wrong. So without question, we must search our hearts. But please, recognize that one time, if you cleared it with man or needed to, and you ask God to forgive you, he does it. That was it. Well, he's so willing to do that. So if you just say, my Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. Did you know what he just did? He just forgave you. Oh, yeah. That was it. Don't mention it no more. But sometimes you feel that guilt, the devil can bring guilt on you as though you have already sinned. I have felt guilt when I didn't even know what I was guilty for. This may be a good point for you if you can't remember it, write it down. If you feel guilt and you don't ever know what you're guilty over, it was the devil gave you that guilt. Now, when God condemns you, he shows you the reason he condemns you. He's fair. But the devil will just load you down and make you feel so guilty. For I lived the first three years of my Christian experience was the most miserable. If I'd have known it before I got the Holy Ghost, I don't know if I'd even got it or not. Terrible. Like lost my mind. Because I did not know that the devil could give me a guilty feeling. He is the accuser of the And if he could give me that feeling and me not have done one thing. Man, I felt like I'd robbed the First National Bank. And here I am saying, my God, forgive me. My mother would say, son, what have you done? I don't know. Well, that's a true sign that it's the devil giving me that feeling. I had to learn that. I had lost my mind. Now, when God starts dealing with you, the first thing he'll do is pour to it. That's wrong. That is. Now, this is why you're feeling bad. That's how you can tell the difference. And if you learn that, your faith will be built up. Because a lot of times, you're feeling bad physically, the devil can come in on you spiritually and make you feel condemned. Did you know that when you're nervous? I've had nerve problems. And early in the morning is a bad time for nerves, or it was for me. And I'd wake up, brother, I'd go to thinking, I'd bound to committed some horrible crime. A man couldn't feel less guilty and not have done something great and bad. I tell you, early in the morning is no time to judge your spirituality. Wait till you wake up a while before you even repent of anything. You'll feel better. <laughs> and a lot of times when you're sick or nervous, the devil takes advantage of that and will give you certain feelings. We'll get back to that more thoroughly and some sermon messages, some examples to try to counteract that in saints. Can you see why you need to counteract it? Right. Here's a saint living, I mean, sensitive conscience to begin with. And that's the one the devil takes advantage of. 
and they could be mighty powerhouses, but here they're sitting, my God, I'm so unworthy, I've done wrong, and I feel so guilty, and they don't know what they're feeling guilty about, and now they go to pray and ask God for a revival. How can they ask for one when they feel like they are just got through unloading the first night, don't they? So the value of releasing them from that oppression, you cannot imagine the value of it to your revival or to your church if uh, you can get them released and their faith built up in God's mercies. You know, we have a problem as apostolics. We just draw lines and then we've got to do it. We've got to say, that's wrong. If you do that, you'll be lost. And you can't do that and be saved. And first thing you know, everybody's looking, my Lord, I've done that. Oh, I've done this. And we get them so sin conscious, which they need to be, but on the other hand, you better every once in a while come along with your message on God's mercies and forgiveness. Or you'll get them so overbalanced till they'll never get beyond step number two. In the man, then you tell them God said he'd forgive them. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, which is a perpetuation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. He can take care of every sin in the world immediately at one time. Surely he can handle our little problem. Step number three, hearken. I've got my heart clean. I believe it's clean. I trusted his mercies. If I did sin, I straightened it out and believed he forgave me. Now then, it's time to start asking for something. Now, Lord, not only do I get your attention, but hearken to me now. And then do something. Boy, is this a point. That's so thoroughly overlooked and yet so simple. Do. Do. And defer not. Don't wait. Do it now. Okay. We're going to get into the depth of it tomorrow night, the Lord willing. Go through the details of all of this again. You see, the reason I've got it outlined like this is all of these points are interwoven into this. There's a direct connection between step number four and your prayer life intercession. Direct connection. When you start saying, God, do something, I imagine Brother Davis could uh, demonstrate this. He's heard me teach it so many times. Oh Lord, do. Do. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, I'll tell you one thing it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean stay down on your knees and say, My God. I'm going to pray my hour today. Oh, Lord. Sometimes they even get a little music with it. <laughs> Jesus. And sometimes I just say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. You know what you're doing. You're not praying. You're thinking. <laughs> See, you can say all of that and think about cows, horses, cars. Oh, God. Look at you can say that for 30 minutes. And grease cars and change tires. Oh God. That tire didn't work right. Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> you're not a person. That's right. You can do that and not even know that you're doing it. Uh, do you realize, since I'm so sensitive to it, I watch it carefully. And you'd be surprised how many people do and claim they prayed an hour. Didn't pray five minutes. God didn't hear a thing said. It's so simple. 
Yes, for the last time. Interesting. Now you answer me by what do you want, brother? Me. Oh, so the Lord, 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 so the I'm asking if you pardon this expression, God must undoubtedly sometimes come to this map his pants and speak up somewhere. Now you've been calling the main for an hour and what are you doing? I wonder why we don't get answers. Come and listen. Say to this tree, this particular tree, be thou plucked up and tell where to go. He taught in his prayer, give us this day our daily bread, pinpointed this day. You know what? Here's our prayers. Lord, me, no evil God. No what? <laughs> no the house? Oh, Brother Bean, he knew what I was thinking about. Sure, he knew what you needed before you were on the mail down there. But don't forget, he won't do a thing about it to you then. My God, stir, stir, stir. Stir the pie of the cake. What you want? <laughs> Brother Bean, that's too technical. No, it's not. The book said bring words. It said say to this mountain. It said say to this tree. Give us this day. General prayers will never be answered. Forget it. Because they require no faith, and faith is the necessary element for you to get your prayer through. If I say, Oh God, save. Save? Okay. I'm able to do that. Who? Take your blank check to the bank, would you? And write up there on the top and say uh, where it says date, anytime. Pay to the order of any old body. Amount, any old amount. See if you can get it. Now God is a mind reader. He sees our thoughts are far off, but I'm contending that he does not answer till we pray. And this is the reason that so many hours are spent and no results. We didn't ask for anything. Stir. Move. Save. Help, O Lord. Help. Help, o Lord. Brother, when you get down and say, God save Jim Brown tonight, <laughs> you're going to have faith or you're not asking for that. Example in the revival in Silsby. I heard him call a man's name was Stephen. Stephen, Stephen, Stephen's every morning prayer I mean pray for Stephen's. Uh, sure, fine, that's fine, but whatever happened, nothing. Pray Lord, take his appetite away so he just quit eating for a few days. Lord take his sleep away so he's a little restless. Wonder why he never comes. So one morning I got up, I said, I've heard Stephen's all I want to hear. Now this is what we're going to pray. God bring Stephen's to church tonight. Fill Stephen's with the Holy Ghost tonight. Bring when you were. Pinpoint it. Do something and don't defer. We sing to the sinner, if you want the Holy Ghost, tell him what you want. 
And then we say, Oh God, storm. <laughs> Wasting your time. It'd be better you'd be more in the lawn washing the car. That's right. I'm not joking. Scripture. Well, the man had never been to the revival, but who do you think came that night? Who do you believe came? Well, you better believe it is. Who do you reckon came to the altar that night? 